Well, good morning, everybody. How you guys doing? You guys well? It is so nice to see you. <laughs> that was really something. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Come on, early service. Wake up. That's better. Um, you guys online, we love you. Thanks for joining in. It is great to have you. My name is Will Davis Jr. If I don't have the pleasure of knowing you, thanks for coming. You're in the right place. This is Austin Christian Fellowship. Can we thank our worship team for doing what they do so well? Um, they'll be back in a minute. They're not done. Um, if you're in the room or online, QR code will be on the screen. This is our way of encouraging you to connect with small groups, with students and children's ministries, with missions and serving and giving and prayer and all the wonderful things we get to do as part of ACF Life around here. There's a lot of really cool things that will encourage you. Men's and women's ministries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Young adult ministries, I could go on and on. Anyway, um, we'd love to have you connect, so make sure you can take that QR code if you want to and um, get back to us. We'll send you a link. We won't show up on your door, I promise. And we'd love to connect with you. You may have noticed the art show on the patio when you, when you came in. So um, Community First is probably the leading example of a healthy, holistic way of dealing with homelessness, if not in the nation, maybe, if not in the globe, maybe in the na definitely in the nation. And its founder, uh, Mobile Loves and Fishes founder, and Community First founder is sitting right here. Alan Graham, would you raise your hand, buddy? It's so good to see Alan. He is... He is royalty in the city of Austin, and what they do has really given people pause on rethinking uh, how to approach homelessness in the city. So the artists, the, the neighbors, they call them, and the residents, they call them neighbors at Community First, one of the ways they support themselves is with art. So last year, they do four art shows a year, and um, is we the first one this year? Is that what you said? Yeah, we're the first one this year, and... Uh, the last time they were here, we, you guys bought a record amount for them. is like $18,000. We're going for 20 today, okay? So get out there. My wife's out there, so you better hurry, okay? Susie's out there prowling as we speak. Um, it's amazing. And again, you'll meet the artists. You'll hear what they have to say. You'll hear their stories. It's one of the coolest things we get to do, sponsored by a missions department. So we'll remind you, but go out, spend some money, meet the, meet the people. And um, if you get a chance to hug on Alan... This is a, he's going to be, we're all going to be looking up to him in heaven. I just want you to know that. What he's done with his life is not easy, um, but so powerful and so good. So we really do have Austin Royalty sitting in our room today. Bless you, sir. Really proud that you're here. Love you dearly. Um, if you need a Bible, will you raise your hand? We have uh, our guest team coming down. We give away Bibles every week, and we'd love to give you one. So if you don't have one, just raise your hand. And the rest of you, if you would turn to Matthew, um, the fifth chapter, uh, feel free to take notes. Feel free to open your copy of Scripture. I have mine. While you're finding Matthew 5, this Wednesday, are you ready? This Wednesday is 900, our 900th prayer meeting in um, the 121, 12 to 1 prayer hour. 900 meetings of prayer. And um, yeah, it's really kind of fun. And so... Um, we're going to have, because we're Christians, we celebrate with food, all right? So we're going to have food in the barn, be live worship at 1130 or 11, and then um, get on the call if you want to. The link's on our website, but we'd love to celebrate 900 days and um, really give God praise for what he's done in our church through the prayer. If you feel God's spirit when you're here, it's because we're praying and we're worshiping and he honors those things. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for... Um, this day, thank you for um, our friends that are here, our neighbors from Community First. I pray they'll feel so loved and so welcome while they're here. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our church and uh, who you're making us. And I pray for um, continued process of growth and transformation before you. Lord, I thank you for the the constant reference to the Beatitudes I heard around our campus this week and other places as small groups are jumping in and we're, we're really learning about um, this amazing teaching you gave us 2,000 years ago. Um, I thank you for what's going on in our city. I pray for rain. I pray you continue to fill the lakes and the aquifers and we thank you for it. We're looking for it. We're expecting it. And we continue to wait for you to move in that way and finish, Lord, what you started there. 
And now, God, I pray that your, your spirit and your power will be control in this room. I pray you'd humble me and um, thank you. Lord, this is a really critical moment as we jump into this first beatitude. So may your name be exalted. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, I can't go any further until you do an expectation check. Okay, Chris, our, our prayer pastor Chris Tapkin led us before the service, the crew that's leading the service in prayer. And he just said, why are you here? What are you expecting? And as I jump into Matthew 5, 3, I kind of want to just nudge that to you. Did you come into church today expectant? Because we're in high cotton in Scripture right now. And I really pray that you'll um, be open to as we, you can't read the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and if you didn't get last week's message, please go back and listen to that as I introduced all this. You can't, really can't read it without transformation in mind. It's transformation. It's designed to change. And I just want you to be open to that. Even if you're not a Christian, if you're online or you're, not a, you're here and you're not a Christ follower, but you're interested, you're here, you're listening, be open to change. Jesus did not stand on a hillside 2,000 years ago and endorse the status quo. He started a revolution. That's why it's called counterculture. And he did so not by calling people to embrace their inner strength and rally and fight. He called them to brokenness before God. That's offensive, right off the top. So I need you to just be open to a little bit of, if you're open, are you open today to the Lord starting a, pro, starting a revolution in you? What are your, expect, what are your expectations? Matthew 5, verse 1 says, And Jesus saw, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's just go with that was not what they were expecting. This is the Messiah figure. This is the... Thousands are following him, big crowd, expectation. Is he here to throw out the Romans and restore the political independence to Israel? And his first salvo into his revolution is blessed are the poor. Not quite a rah-rah campaign speech, let's go take the hill. It's complete opposite of what they're expecting. And it gets worse from there. So what we begin today is a walk through these eight Beatitudes. We're going to take us into almost up to Thanksgiving. I said last week that the Beatitudes are the equivalent of the preamble to the Constitution. This is the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom way of living, the kingdom way of thinking. And it's completely counterintuitive for any of us on the planet because we're, we're just by flesh different. The Genesis 3 sin effect makes us think differently. And Christ is saying, let me just flip this for you and show you about what I'm creating and invite you into it. But the door to get into my kingdom requires a complete change of thinking, a complete change of living, and it, and it requires you to come to the absolute end of yourself or you can't get in. <laughs> Put that in your glossy brochure and try to promote it. Leave your possessions, your junk, your baggage, your sin at the door. Leave your ego and your pride and your resume and your pedigree at the door. Leave your portfolio at the door. It doesn't matter in the kingdom. Rank does not apply in the kingdom. Social status does not apply in the kingdom. Education levels, where you are in the born in the world and what time in history you're born in the world, doesn't matter in the kingdom. The ground's level. You want to check that at the door? Because that's what's required to come into the kingdom. 
I'm solving our parking problem right now, I know, with the introduction of this message. But that's what he said. Friends, Christianity has become this soft, marshmallow-like, you know, politically on a certain tone, not requiring much thing. But if you read Jesus, it wasn't that at all. So we're jumping into a call to something with a little bit more teeth in it. It's going to challenge, I told you last week, if you study the Beatitudes, and we're going to start it today, there's going to be a collision between how we all live and think and what Scripture says about what Jesus expects of us as disciples. Remember, he saw a crowd, he went up the hill, but only the disciples followed him. Not just the 12, but people who wanted to follow him. The crowd didn't come up the hill, just the disciples did. These, ex, these eight statements are dividers between the crowd and the disciples. Which are you? The word blessed, which is why these are called the Beatitudes, because um, it's the Latin word for blessed. Happy is a really cheap translation. It's bigger than happiness. Is makarios, gonna put it on the screen, makarios. So everybody say makarios. Sounds like you're sneezing, so you say bless you, get it? <laughs> makarios, bless you, get it? Makarios means blessing, never mind. I worked all week on that, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> work longer. Uh, makarios is the Greek word for bless. So makarios begins every one of these sentences. Blessed, blessed, rich receiving all the goodness of God. That's the, the compliment Jesus gives to all these crazy conditions. Persecuted, poor in spirit, mourning, gentle. You're blessed. Makarios, you're blessed. You're rich from God's standpoint. That who is, he who is poor in spirit is rich in the kingdom. He or she who is mourning is rich in the kingdom. He or she who, he or she who is seeking righteousness and only righteousness above earthly wealth is rich in the kingdom. It's just, it's, makarios is this new way of thinking about life. In the Beatitudes, I'll say this every week, there's a, there's a condition and a promise. As he walks through these eight preamble statements, he gives a condition, blessed are, fill in the blank, that's a condition. They are this, the promise. It's a condition promise. And the conditions all build one upon the other. The poor in spirit leads to mourning, and which produces comfort, which produces gentleness, which produces a hungering, thirsting for righteousness. They're, they're progressive, as we talked about last week. So the word poor, let's talk about the condition. The word poor means to cringe. There are about eight levels of social standing in Jesus' day from the religious and political elite, the wealthy, all the way down to the agrarian, the farmers, um, slaves, and then the poor, the word Jesus uses here. So he, he in, in says, Bakarios, are these guys. Well, that's, no one thought that was true, obviously. Really? Like, I don't feel very makarios. I don't feel very blessed. It's a word that, that speaks of someone who has, that literally, the word to cringe gives the image of a beggar. I remember the first time I saw a beggar, I was like, I was in London. I had never seen one in America growing up in the, in the 70s. And so I was in London, and we came out of an opera house, and I, there was the beggars on the street. I guess I had, because I remember in Acapulco seeing the young boys outside the boat asking for pesos. We'd throw them in the water, and they'd dive down and get them. But I hadn't really seen somebody, like, confronting me. Can you help me? And they do so humbly. And I never forget doing a food distribution in Nicaragua and seeing a man that we were giving a two-week supply of food to, and the shame of his inability to provide for his family was so strong, he couldn't look us in the eyes. 
He was just, he was just this, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so, I don't like being in this situation. I have to have a gift. I have to have help. I don't like it, but I don't have the means to change things for my family. Can you please help me? And he wouldn't look up at us. He was a strong, robust man, but he's covered in embarrassment and shame over his situation. That's the word <laughs> that Jesus uses. Jesus is not applauding poverty here. And we know that because of what he adds next in spirit. In spirit. The impoverished spiritually. Now, Jesus was, as he gave this message, I'm sure somewhere in that crowd were those very strong many of them well-meaning religious elite who had all the rules and all the regulations and they wore the robes and they were the, they were the rule makers spiritually and unless you were like them, you weren't making the cut in their mind. And Jesus basically contrasts the poor in spirit person to the religious boasters, boasters or the people who in today's American thinking, you're gonna get to heaven because you're a really good person or you're better than the next guy. That's the typical way of thinking, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm good enough to make the cut. Really? What's the cut? Well, I'm better, I'm not Hitler. I'm not Mussolini. No, okay, good, but have you ever sinned? Yeah, well, that's the standard. You gotta be perfect. You have to be perfect to get to heaven. So the person who's poor in spirit has come to the painful realization that they don't make the cut. The person who's poor in spirit may be a, a Wall Street CEO or CFO, but before God, they got nothing. They might be a Nobel Peace Prize winner, but before God, they have nothing. They might be someone who, who has got huge celebrity and fame in our nation or even around the world because they're a rock star or they're a well-known artist or, they do, or they're a literary genius or they're a supermodel or they're a world-class athlete, someone that will walk into any corner pretty much of the globe and people know who they are. But before God, they have nothing. See, this is why it's called counterculture because the people we exalt in the planet, on the planet, may or may not be big before God. But the, the standing before God that gets you credit is brokenness because you simply have come to the realization, the painful realization, that before holy God, I got nothing. Friends, this is not a, a, an attempt on Jesus to browbeat us. It's an attempt on Jesus to remind us of why the law was there and to remind us of what happened in Genesis 3, that everybody on the planet has been infected with a terrible disease called sin, and unless he does something, we're done. See, religion is man's effort to solve the problem. It can't solve the problem. It doesn't address what's inside. So Jesus begins his call to his kingdom with the declaration, if you realize you have nothing to stand for, nothing to stand on before God, you're not trying to impress him, you're not gonna show your pedigree in his face, you're not gonna say, hey, yeah, but God, look at me. When you, when you get to that point of all you can do really is just, oh God, I'm just, I don't have, I'm so, I'm, I'm that guy in Nicaragua. I got nothing, please have mercy on me. Then you get it. Amen. Now, I mean, we live in a country that's, you know, hey, come on, God, let's see what you got. Do you really want to see what he's got? So Jesus says, the king, it's the first sentence of the Beatitudes. The whole thing starts with poverty spiritually. It's not a poverty before which you rebel. It's a poverty you welcome when you come to the realization that I may be something on earth, I'm nothing before God. And I'm talking to a room full of people, most of us are something on earth compared to, we're not considered most of us in the least of these that Jesus talked about. We're the ones in a position to help the least of these. And so it's kind of hard to see yourself as bankrupt before God when you're helping solve problems. But again, his grading, his grading system is not based on what you do. His grading system is what's in your spirit. And all of our spirits have been polluted. 
We're born, David says, in sin. Do you see the scandal of this message? Do you see how offensive this is? Do you see how absolutely counter to popular thinking and pop thinking and self-help thinking and you can do it? It's, it's from, the, from the standpoint of what sells, this doesn't sell. And it's where Jesus started his invitation. It's not that you're a bad person necessarily. It's just that you're broken. And if you don't understand you're broken, you're never going to fit into the kingdom. Because the kingdom begins with brokenness. Blessed are the broken. Blessed are the blessed. Makarios. Blessed are those who understand that they have to have a gift from God every single day or they can't do what he asks. They have to have a daily manna, a daily bread from God to do the kingdom. <laughs> now in the spirit of restore, which is our church's, listen to Labor Day message if you haven't heard it, our church's effort to kind of slow down a bit given what we've been through together the last couple of years. The Beatitudes are a wonderful next step for trying to figure out how do I gear back a little bit because what they end up allowing you to do is get off the treadmill. I told you last week that the Beatitudes offer a way out of the rat race and a way off of the treadmill because you'll realize that the rat race and the treadmill, the treadmill don't mean beans before a holy God. You might be getting a lot of accolades on the planet, but when you stand before a holy God, he's not going to ask you about your resume or how you retired or what zip code you lived in or what you made on the SAT. Thank God. I was talking to a friend this week whose daughter made a 1510 on the SAT. Isn't 1600 like perfect? Right? I made a, I made a 1080 on the SAT. Don't laugh. That's so rude that you laugh at me. And she, I'm like, she, the girl says, she wants, my daughter wants to take it again. She's not satisfied. I said, she made a 1,500. That's impressive. I have no idea why I'm talking about this. So I'm going to move on. Okay, I'm totally lost. Restore gets you off the treadmill. Well, the Beatitudes are the invitation to get off the treadmill and get out of the rat race. It's that renewing your mind, that new way of thinking that says, I've been barking up the, whole, the wrong tree. I'm chasing after the wrong things. And all this begins with me getting to the end of myself before God and being okay with it. Are you there? Are you ready to, be at the, are you ready to come to the end of yourself? Makarios, blessed, <laughs> are the beggars. The ones who come to the holy God and say, help. Sorry, God, I can't impress you. That's, you're right. Good. Now, here's the promise. Yours is the kingdom. Everything that the kingdom of God is begins with your understanding of your desperation. That welcome, welcome to the kingdom. When you get to the end of yourself and you realize that you can't perform and you can't work hard enough and you can't say enough remembered prayers and you can't give enough money and you can't be a good enough person and you can't whatever, join enough self-help thing, read enough self-help, whatever. You, there's nothing you can do to move the heart of the holy God to find you acceptable as you are because you're broken. When you get to that point of brokenness, he says, you're the kind of person the kingdom is looking for. Because now I can flow through you and now I can work through you and now I can move through you. Now we've gotten rid of all the junk and the pride and the arrogance and this is why blessed are the, the, the gentle, the meek, the humble. I can flow through them. There's not a lot of stuff for me to fight in somebody who's broken. Broken people don't fight back. They say, tell me what to do. There's no resistance. There's no, I got an alternative plan, God. No, so I'm, I have nothing. What do you want me to do? I can use that. Let's go. Those are the world changers. Those are the people who bring life to people because life is flowing through them. 
But again, it begins with that understanding that I can't do this on my own. It's one of the most powerful, friends, this is one of the most powerful, radical, counterintuitive messages you can ever hear. Because everything about our, our world is saying, go, 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 you can do it. Not when it comes to God, you can't. That's why Jesus has to come to a cross and die to make a way so we can have access to him. Theirs, the poor, the broken, the beggars. Theirs is, present tense, right now in this life, the grace, the forgiveness, the riches, the joy, the adoption, the security, the power, the authority, all the things that are, you're now not just a citizen of the kingdom, you're a child or daughter, son or daughter of the king. And all of that, all that that means of being a citizen of the kingdom and a son or daughter of the king is yours now as one of the broken ones. It's, it's the, the, the lifting from the, the lowest in social rung to the highest in eternity is what happens when you come to the end of yourself and God says, boom, you got the kingdom. Now let's go be a kingdom together. It's crazy. There are dozens of verses in scripture that talk about the, the benefits of brokenness. Psalm 51 is a confessional song from David. David was confessing adultery and murder and conspiracy to commit murder. That's a bad day. In Psalm 51, you gotta read it. Psalm 32 is the same kind of psalm where David is, okay, God, I gotta get real. I'm at the, he's at the end of himself. He's got nothing to, he's got nothing to brag, brag on before God. He's lost a baby. He's blown up a marriage. He's been told violence is never gonna leave your home because of what you've done. I mean, he's having a bad day. And he says in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. God resists the proud. He will come against the arrogant, but he will rush in a hurry to the humble. Even the humble who messed up big time. And when you, when you get before God and you see the condition of your heart, it humbles you. Unless you're too insecure or too proud to admit it. If you're still on, I don't think I'm that bad, you don't get the kingdom and you don't get God. You don't get holiness yet. God is not a peer. He's not our equal. So, What would the door of the kingdom look like? I Googled doors this week. Got some really good rock and roll. It wasn't really what I was looking for, but oh yeah, they were awesome. Um, but I was looking for doors that require you to change your posture. And the only thing I could really find was, and I knew about was this prayer hill in um, Seoul, Korea, that the Koreans would go out to and spend a weekend in prayer and fasting, and there are little, just really holes dug into the hill that you go into, and they're only like three feet off the ground, so you have to crawl in. The only way into the, the, only way into the, the prayer hole is you crawl in and you just stay on your knees. That's kind of it, but I, I, if, I, if I had a door on stage here, I'd kind of be asking, this is not what the door of the kingdom looks like because the door, my dad had a, we had a door in our house growing up that only it was, it was to his tool shed, and this shows you how much he used his tool shed because the door didn't work. And so it was either the foundation was off or the door was off, but either way, you could only open about eight inches, the door. And to get in, you kind of had to do this uh, Elaine Dance. You kind of had to do the Elaine thing um, to get in the door. That's not far off from what the kingdom is like. Because at some point it requires this, this cringing before God. Not over who he is. 
but over who we are. What's the door look like? So bottom line, I'll try to give you a bottom line each week. I'm going to give you a condition, a promise, and a bottom line every week, okay? Bottom line, entrance into God's kingdom requires brokenness over our spiritual condition. Entrance into the kingdom, what's the entrance fee? You're going to an amusement park, you're going to a movie theater, or you're going to a Sixth Street bar to hear somebody play. What's the cover charge? Well, the cover charge of the kingdom is brokenness. Not show me what you have, it's show me what you don't have. That's where I can work. That's why this whole thing is so counterintuitive, friends, because we're bred to say, I got it. And the kingdom, this is the first sentence. The kingdom begins with desperation. <laughs> so I walked out of the house um, Thursday after work, and we have bird feeders, and we have clear windows, and we have birds that can't tell the difference. And every once in a while we hear this. I have a, we have an a, a impression on one of our windows. It looks like an angel. With this, I think it was a pigeon, just did a perfect face plant into our window, and it just feathers this outline of a just angelic looking thing, but it was a pigeon. Sometimes they fly away and they're fine. Sometimes we find them and they haven't survived. Just happens. So, and I know there's ways to prevent that, but we're not willing to cover our windows to protect the birds. It's just a selfish thing. You can put things outside. We put a little uh, strobe ball outside on the windows to see if it's going to work. It looks so tacky, but we're trying to save the birds. So I walked outside Thursday, and there is a cardinal. I've never seen a bird in this position before. On its back, beak open, wings out, feet in the air. This one had a hard hit, and I thought, well, she's dead, and I'm going to deal with her. And I reached down, would have worn gloves, and I picked her up, and I noticed she was alive. So um, I turned her over, and she sat up in my hand. And she was in bad, she was stunned. Her beak was open, her breathing was really, um, what I guess for a bird, at a pretty rapid pace. But she made no effort to get away, which I knew she was not quite with it yet. So I thought, well, this is interesting. I got to, okay. So I went and just sat down in a chair, and I don't know what, came, I was, I don't know what came over me. I started speaking life into the bird. <laughs> I did. I was Francis of Austin, a sissy. And I said, you're going to live and not die. And I would stroke it and rub under its little beak, and then it had a little tuft on the back of its head, and I'd just stroke it and say, you know, you're going to live and not die. Amen. You're not going to be the sparrow that falls to the ground today and no one notices. And I speak life into you and I breathe life into you and I pray, Lord, I pray you'd save this little bird. It just, I've never done that before. Strange moment of compassion on my part, I know. But I was like, okay, you're gonna breathe and you're gonna be okay. And so after about five or 10 minutes of that, the bird closed its beak and began to kind of move around and then hopped from my hand to my knee. I was sitting in a chair with my leg crossed and he hopped under my knee. I thought, okay, this is progress. Still no attempt to fly away. So I thought, okay, so maybe I can get her in a branch and I'm done with my role here. But I think she's going to live. So we used to have a parakeet, so I just stuck my little finger out and she stepped right on my finger. And I held her up and I put her on this hand and I, there's a branch right here. So I put, I put my hand up toward the branch for her to jump onto the thing and she went all the way to right here. Look. <laughs> by the way, on my right arm, that is bird poop, by the way. <laughs> that white fleck is bird poop, which made me think she was going to be okay. And she sat there a minute. So I said, Susie, I waved at Susie and said, look at this. And so Susie came out and got a picture. We took a video, and um, I stayed there for a few minutes, and then she flew away. She flew and landed down. She was still a little not quite with it, but I think she flew into the grass, and then I couldn't find her a few minutes later. So I think she, and about 20 minutes later, I don't know if it was her, but there was a female cardinal sitting on the fence right where she'd flown, singing her heart out. So I'm going to go in my brain with that was her. Okay? That is a wonderful picture of what God will do with you when you've crashed and burned. 
when you're flat on your back, feet in the air, beak open, dead. He says, yours, if you'll receive it, is the kingdom. You're, perfect, you're in a perfect position for me to scoop you up and speak life into you and speak a new identity into you as a child of the king and make you safe and make you whole. But you have to be that you have to be as broken as that little bird was for him to move. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen of Austin Christian Fellowship, God is inviting you into brokenness. It's where his life begins. So these guys are gonna sing over us. And what I want you to do during this song is just invite I've been praying for the gift of brokenness in my life for probably 20 years. It's a dangerous prayer. But it's where the kingdom begins. So why don't you ask God, you ready, to, can you do this? Lord, break me. Get me to the end of myself so you can start. God, I ask you to bless this time, these few minutes we have together. In Jesus' name.